I'm happy to welcome our next speaker, John Katzman, who is uh, presenting a report on Saigilo Magena. Thank you for that introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm John. Uh, I'm one of Professor Musa's students, first year students. Uh, I'm not an Africanist by any means. Uh, by academic training, I'm a political scientist. So I am, by all means, a complete and total amateur when it comes to this. However, my current area of research is the role of youth in military regime transition in Sierra Leone and Liberia. But uh, as of so far, I'm very out of my depth, but it was a very interesting project that I had conducted last year as part of Professor Moose's uh, African Language and Culture class, and I'd love to present it. So this will be a presentation a bit on Sagil Magina, which I'm led to believe that some of you already have a preliminary knowledge of, but also a little bit uh, about my <laughs> experiences being out of my depth and engaging in uh, non-social scientific research, shall I say. So uh, the way I got this project was my previous uh, experiences with Africa had only been through Vice News on YouTube, you know, the cannibal warlords of Liberia, Africa's capitalist truckers. So of course, when Professor Moose gives everyone these topics you can choose from, the uh, dandies of the Congo, or uh, various writers, you know, I had to be my usual bombastic loudmouth self and say, oh, oh yeah, I know that, I know that. So he says, I'll give you something a little bit difficult. He says, research Sagio Magina. So of course, I start on Google. When you Google Sagio Magina, you get four results. Three of the results have nothing to do with Sagio Magina. The one result that does <laughs> is the Tuga Naraku, a comparison of substance. Not sure of the rest of the title, but anyways, the only uh, available source on the internet is from Professor Moose. So I email him and I say, okay, what can you tell me? He says, no, it's not going to be that easy. So surprise, surprise, I had to go to the library, which was very, very new for me. Uh, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, but needless to say, I was terrified. But then I figured, okay, well, I'm still not finding much, so I'll go on Facebook, as you know, every academic does, right? <laughs> so I find an Iraqi group on Facebook and I start messaging back and forth with one of the admins. And he's telling me, you know, all of these, you know, little tales like this where Gidamo, so I had no idea what it was. And he's telling me that, oh, it's like a milk calabash and that's significant because white people are represented by milk. A lot of things that I was like, Ugh, okay. But then I was like, okay. So I'm trying to find sources. And then I say, how can I he listen to this? He says, it's not documented, only from elders. Well, as a social scientist, that's terrifying. Because you need, whatever you get, it needs to be academic, it needs to be from a journal, it needs to be from a book. And uh, the lifeblood of political science is the quantitative method. Qualitative is terrifying. Personal interviews are even more terrifying, small n, the worst thing you can ever imagine. So needless to say, yeah, very, very confused. But eventually, uh, Professor Moose gives me a tip. He says, try spelling it differently. I say, okay, so I eventually start finding a variety of sources. The issue is nothing ever talks directly about Saigiu Magina, the diviner. It's usually rather in the context of uh, lingual disparity. He's a very popular folk figure, so he comes up a lot in a lot of lingual research, of course. But still, it was very little biographical information, so it had to be very patchwork. So eventually you find a lot of things from Blystad uh, and other researchers who did similar work. Uh, but the, the main issue is that even with all of these researches, it's all still conjecture. So I like to pull attention to this quote here, uh, basically detailing the beginning of the myth of Saigio. So essentially, his father, or rather his tribe, the, the Toga, are driven out of their homeland in the Dogorongoro crater uh, due to a Maasai attack. And the only way we know that this attack happened was a 15-year approximation of when the battle took place is the fact that the past the Maasai took into the crater was named after an age set whose circumcisions occurred in 1836, and therefore we have to assume that this battle had to have taken place sometime in a 15-year span because there's a path named after a group of Maasai children, and therefore we it's a third-degree conjecture. So very, very confusing for me, but eventually I'm kind of learning, okay, there's a story everywhere. How do we connect it? But then eventually everything comes together and we get this small biography. And there are a lot of continuing complications because most of the source material, as I said before, regarding Sagio, is not directly about Sagio. 
The biographical information about Saigio comes from Guido Mausa, his son by his, I believe, second senior wife. And essentially, he was the last great leader of the Tatoga before the German occupation of Tangaika. And what happened essentially was that he was executed uh, because most academics come to the conclusion that the Totoga presented a power sharing dispute with the colonial authority, and the colonial authority thought it prudent that by killing the most powerful Totoga leader, they'd be able to minimize influence and thereby increase colonial influence. So we get a lot of source material through the example of, okay, Saigio is relevant as the father of Gitamosa, but what the actual relevance of Saigio is was still very muddled. We're getting conflicting dates uh, regarding, as I showed you before, you have a 15 year span of when you can actually predict most of the events happen, but still, even in colonial times, or I'm sure even the Dutch know, and well, with most European colonial powers, there's extensive documentation of everything that happens. You know, you can find manifests regarding supplies from, you know, Indonesia or Tangaika, yet somehow, even the colonial period, we're still getting differentiating dates. The red-toed men. So essentially, uh, the one of the great legends of Saigio is that he predicts that from the east, uh, men with uh, red toes will come uh, and kind of save the Totoga people. They, they will be the liberating force from all of their difficulties from the attacks of other tribes. And the story goes that the Germans show up wearing red boots, and it is very confusing to me because Saigio's presented as this diviner, this all-knowing prophet, but however, how could he have made this false prediction and portrayed the Germans as the saviors of the toga when they were actually the destructors of the toga? And that's not very discussed so much. That'd be a very uh, interesting dichotomy to pursue. Well, to what extent is Saigio omnipotent, all-knowing, and to what extent can we associate these kind of falsehoods with the overarching myth. And I think perhaps the most interesting implication as a social scientist are the, uh, the impact that the legend of Saigio has on current sexual practices in Mabulu district. I'm not sure, perhaps you've uh, heard of some of this in your research, but Mabulu in Tanzania is known for having one of the higher uh, incidences of HIV and other STD transmissions. And one of the reasons, if I, uh, they give a quote from my piece, is because Saigio, according to the village elder, as most of this goes, is that uh, once the Datoga start to ignore respectful coupling, or in other words, traditional sexual behavior, it would thereby lead to sexual promiscuity and would be the end of the Datoga people. And therefore, they kind of construe that, okay, well, uh, condoms are, do, are not part of what is considered traditional sexual behavior. And my question comes in as well, polyurethane condoms did not exist in 1890s Mabulu district. So how can we construe that somehow they are against traditional uh, sexual practices? But really the significance of Saigio, I mean, that's the ultimate question. What relevance does this diviner from the 1890s in Northern Tanzania have today is that his messages are being construed to have current day meanings and in a sense it's a little bit dangerous because if you take someone who I mean that's the story of religion across the world right you take these messages from well-respected people and you construe them to your own gains you can see a lot of political implications as to you know what good leadership represents because the Magina family is known very much for always being leaders and even today we see their descendants hold a higher social stature than uh, others in the community uh, in terms of further reading, I'd highly recommend uh, for any of you that have further interest not only in Saigio, but the overarching history of the Totoga, published just this year by uh, Medija from uh, the University of Gauteng in Germany, The Collapse of Pastoral Economy, the Totoga of Central and Northern Tanzania from 1830s to the 2000s, gives a really interesting viewpoint on the not only the migrations of the Totoga, but the uh, current implications of what is considered a historical shame. I don't want to put it as a historical shame. I think that the overarching message of Saigio is that he was the last great Totoga, and so was his son Gitamosa. 
and you get the German colonial era, and they're shamed by the execution of Gitomosa and the declining influence of the Totoga. And what ended up happening was that the Iraqu became the kind of the dominant political force in the area. And we can see a lot of current day connotations stemming from this event that happened over 100 years ago and how it influences not only Totoga Iraqu interactions, but also Totoga interactions with the greater Tanzanian society. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I think we have a question. A question, yeah. I, I, I'm interested because I, I just finished uh, transcribing a, a long story that was told to me about uh, Saigilo Magena uh, among the Gorwa. Um, and uh, it's interesting, I mean, you raised the fact that it's, it seems like it's somewhat incongruent that, the, that Saigilo would have prophesied that uh, the, the Red Toad men would have come to the aid of the Totoga. Uh, the story that I heard was that uh, one night Saigilo had another vision, and he called uh, the traditional uh, doctors of the area all together. And uh, now, of course, he knew what had happened, but he called them all together and he said, did you dream anything last night? And continuously, in, in order, they said, no, Saigilo, I didn't dream anything last night, continually. Until, uh, until the Iraq traditional doctor, Be'a al-Banka, came forward. And uh, he said, Be'a, did you dream anything last night? And he said, no. And Saigilo said, you're lying to me. I know you did. And he said, yes, yeah, I dreamed of a uh, red-toed man, a white man, who, who came. And uh, Saigilo said, you made a big mistake because uh, they're going to come to you instead of me. And it was a mistake only from Saigilo's point of view because they came to the Iraq and, and the Iraq gained their allegiance beforehand. So Saigilo had this prophecy that they were originally going to come to the Totoga. Instead, um, what happened was Be'a had summoned them beforehand. He, he took down a wall, essentially, that was protecting the Rift Valley area from outside influence from the east. And uh, that's what happened. So they ended up arriving with the Iraq first. And there was this sort of exchange, at least in the story that was told, told to me. They, they thought, they said, no, these, they were supposed to come to me. And he said, well, you know, I've already done the deed now, so they're going to come to me first. And then there was a follow-up prophecy. He said, well, when they come to you, you're going to send them to me. Whenever they come to you, you might be dead. But whenever they come, they're going to, you're going to send them to me and will be killed. Yeah, it's very interesting that you say that. I mean, I think the, the great issue comes, personally for me, that I'm, of course, not a speaker by Iraq, <laughs> so everything is coming to me uh, third-hand, I suppose, from academic sources. That's but fantastic also, that all this, that you managed to find all this. It's yes, but I mean, also the issue I find is that, like what you were saying, is that you have these discrepant myths, you know, I, this is completely different from everything I've heard, but then the issue arrives that the, the people who are telling these myths are the village elders, so it's a restricted class of people that has knowledge or access to these stories. So it's difficult to come up with one conclusive narrative of who Sagilo was. And I mean, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a question of Sagilo, the person who existed in flesh and blood, and then Sagilo as sort of the legend. And with the question of Sagilo, he kind of exists between both, right? Because he was a historical figure, but he was also sort of a concept, an idea, right? You know, and a legend. So, you know, and, and, and those stories, they're taken and they're changed and they're retooled and repurposed, however many times, you know. Yeah, it's, it's quite fascinating. Very, it's an very nice. excellent presentation. Thank you. I think we have time for perhaps one more question. Yeah? Um, I have a question and a little bit of anecdote. Um, so, the question so, you make a really nice point that um, you know, the colonial enterprise was really meticulously documented. Um, can we be sure that there's maybe not something out there that we've not, you know, in an archive somewhere that might be worth hunting down? Um, Quite possibly. I mean, I'm not sure how open the, the Germans are, are regarding their colonial records. I know there's still a lot of issues, yeah. especially in Belgium, with, you know, yeah. accessing, you know, what actually happened in the Congo. So, also, I'm not a very good German speaker, so <laughs> even if those documents did exist. But I'm sure anyone who did have the, maybe now that you're, you're based in Cologne, will you be able to <laughs> look further into that and let us know what you, what you find. Um, and then I just wanted to tell you how I came across Sagila Magena, which is um, the Toga people, when they swear or curse, um, they often utter the names of significant male ancestors. Um, and it's usually their father or their grandfather. But one day, one woman was really cross with something, and she went, Sagila Magena. And I was like, who is this? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's living on in that kind of way, too, with these everyday.
practices. Yeah, it just permeates the entire yeah. culture. Yeah, that's... I like how you described him as a kind of folk figure because, you know, it's what it is. Yeah. Hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you. Oh, and if uh, anyone would like to take a look, there are some copies that you can grab on the way out to lunch. If nothing, good reading for the train on the way home. <laughs> <laughs>